first time I'm doing this talk, so it's going to be probably really ratchet and <laughs> not too joined up, but we're going to work our way through it. And by the time you hear it for a third time later on in the year, I'm sure it'll be really great. Um, I was going to call this How to Save a Burning Platform, because I tend to think of programs as platforms these days. Um, and then I thought, well, not everyone does, so maybe I'll change it back, which is why it was a really great platform picture. Um, and so maybe it should just be like burning program. Um, there isn't a happy ending to this talk. <laughs> I probably chose the worst subject in the world as well. Having been through lots of programs that have failed for various reasons, I started with a bit of a flow in terms of the things that made a program fail and the things that I thought were frictionful and stopped us from obtaining value from the program. Um, and actually, just thinking about it, there's so many things that prevent us from resignating value from the things that we've been successful with in a program um, that if you don't join the dots all the way through, it just sort of fails anyway, so maybe you can help me find a happy ending to this. Um, tweet me, because um, it's nice to come off here and find feedback, whether it's good or bad. Um, and on my blog, at some point, I will write this up. I tend to write up all my talks and give everything up, which takes an entire weekend, but they're on there. Um, so maybe you can find some useful stuff, like Terraform through release management with the STS and some other interesting challenges that I faced. Um, I got told my talk needs to be an hour. I've only ever done 30 minutes talk, so I'm terrified about the level of content in this, so we're just going to fit the Q&A by coming too early, which I might be because I talk pretty really fast when I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> so just to clarify, when I talk about a program, it's generally an agile program. Um, if somebody tells me it's waterfall, it won't come work for you. Um, and if it's an agile transformation, that's usually the sort of thing that I work on. Um, I guess every transformation that I'm involved in generally avoid, uh, involves building something, which is my expertise. I sit somewhere over development and operations and sort of tell a whole story from how we build software, how products is involved in um, understanding what we should be giving back in terms of value and, and that domain, um, taking it all the way through the dev process and, and introducing that quality very, very early, um, and then moving security to the left uh, and taking it all the way through to production. Um, so, how, I have a question, how many programs have you worked on that have been deeply fucked? Um, I almost want to invert it and say, can I see like hands, and I, this is terrible because I hate when people do this, but can I see hands for people that have worked on a program that was successful? Very low numbers, which is what I suspected, which tells us that actually these things don't seem to work very well for various reasons, but we're just not doing enough about making them better, which is an interesting thing that maybe somebody should work on at some point. Um, the number one reason that I like to lead and that I prefer to be leadership um, is greatness, obviously. That's not. Um, <laughs> it's because I want someone to be there who will listen and take action when something isn't flowing. Um, I think it's really important to have somebody that actually does take action when you talk to them that, that doesn't leave you feeling disenfranchised that you said, hey, this is wrong. Um, Probably we'll talk about the book uh, Powerful by Patty McCord quite a lot. Um, and she mentioned something in that book about what is a sackable offense at Netflix. And she says that a sackable offense is something where you knew there was a problem, but you didn't say anything. Uh, and that's an interesting point. I think people being disenfranchised is not a bad thing. I think it's good to, to get that feedback. But if you leave them disenfranchised, you create a toxicity in the program. And, and that basically doesn't work out the way you want it to work out. Um, top 10 reasons your program is a burning tire pile. <laughs> this is picture is good, right? Like, I tried really hard on this. Um, a lack of trust and autonomy. Again, the book by Patty McCord, Powerful, talks about people uh, entering an organization um, and not using the word empowered, but to actually say that by default, people are powerful. They have the power already, right? You have to remind them that you hire them because they, they, they're already great. We want them to come and do some stuff for us. They want us to take action. You don't need to empower them to do it. You just have to tell them, go and do it. And seek forgiveness rather than permission. Um, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword, but I guess if you're saying you've hired somebody, it's almost uh, an explicit trust to start with, right? Until it's proven wrong. Um, trust means making yourself vulnerable. And I think especially when you are leadership or you are leading a program or you own particular parts of the program, uh, you can be spread quite thin, and it's quite hard to keep controls on the things that are responsible, you're responsible for, and so 
you have to inevitably delegate those to people um, and you have to trust those people and so for me when I own things and, and development is mine or DevOps is mine or whatever the areas that I get involved in, I have to give that to somebody, I have to trust that they're going to do the right thing which is uh, <laughs> incredibly difficult actually for me. Um, and I, I, you just sort of have to find some really great people. And I don't, I don't know if there's a good answer for this one, but um, I, I've actually been theorizing, like, is there a way to remain hands-on and leadership and sort of stand this stuff up bit by bit in the right way that you want it run and then roll off onto the next thing and let that person lead? Maybe that's a better way to, to get the result that you want um, without micromanaging. Um, trust is the foundation of love. If someone comes in and says, you know, you're going to do a really great job, that's fantastic, you know, go and do your thing. I think it makes me feel really great as an engineer. Um, it makes me feel great as a leader when someone says, come and do this thing, you've got this big old area, um, go and do what you're great at. It's a huge thing for me, so I think it's really important that, that you make sure this resonates well with your team. And then, I had to put this in because it was part of the series and it looked really funny. Um, I don't know how it really connects with the thing, but it can go horribly wrong if you trust the wrong person too. Um, <laughs> and they'll screw you over, so uh, it's, it's a pretty picture. Um, trust is earned, and this probably comes back to what I was talking about uh, Agile as. It's, uh, Agile creates credit, it creates money, it creates equity. Um, when you're successful with Agile, you can, um, oh, this is useful, it's tied, yeah, it's bankable. Um, you can go and bank this, this trust, you can go and use it as a source of equity to go and do something. Um, when you're successful, it gives the business confidence that you're doing the right thing, and because we're doing these small units, we get this credit. And you can go and use that and spend it on experiments or fuck up. So when you get to go and do a spike, it's going to take a little bit longer than the thing that you normally go and do. You could go and use some of that trust, and people will say, well, you've been quite successful in things that you've delivered to date. Of course, you can go and go and do that thing, and we trust you it's the right thing to go and do. Um, and of course, when you screw up, I always talk about <coughs> framing and how important it is to frame something. You know, if we go and bomb and we post mortem and, and something terrible, we've lost you know, 44,000 for the sake of argument. If we can go and pull six things out of that post mortem, those are probably six things that we could fix that you would probably never even get from a consultancy. <coughs> six incredibly valuable things. So it's how you go back to the business and frame that mistake. Even if it is a mistake to you, and, and especially when you're leadership, it, it is a mistake, but it's important to go frame with the business and you control the frame. And with your team as well, you, you are absolutely able to influence the boundaries of, of what you're doing. So make sure you react in the right way because, because culture is a, a co-creational process. Um, architects, love these guys, I'm sorry. If there are any architects, I'm really going to piss you off and generalize. Um, I'm not a massive fan of architects, to be honest, so there's a long list of reasons why. Um, but they're, they're usually the source of plenty of problems within programs. Um, no sense of good development. I've met lots of architects who haven't come from that dev background or haven't come from that dev background for a very long time um, and don't understand quality development. And for me, it's incredibly, incredibly frustrating when I find technologies that have been picked that are untestable, um, technologies that appear like little boxes with lines between them on the board and they aren't. Um, it's very frustrating. And for us to go and implement quality at the very, very beginning, and some enterprise architects are going to pick something because it ticks some boxes on a market scan. Um, it, it's totally the wrong thing. Um, testing is absolutely more work than developing. It will take you more time and effort to do the testing than it will to do the implementation, without a shadow of a doubt. 100% test coverage is easy, but it's not nearly enough. Saying 80%, I had this argument the other day, someone was saying to me, well, you're a purist, or every 100% is quite high, maybe we'll go for 80%. And to me, actually, what well, 80% probably covers a good path. <coughs> so what are you saying? 20% of your functionality isn't going to work, but you don't mind it not working? That's fucking stupid, right? If you're testing, if you're testing, you, your negatives are probably going to be 80%, right? Maybe even more. Your negatives are a magnitude of six, seven times the amount of work required for the implementation. If you go and write a post uh, endpoint in a Node.js Web uh, Express <coughs> application, you're going to test your good path. But then you're going to test an empty payload, you're going to test a truncated payload, you're going to test a schema invalidated payload, you're going to make sure that your headers don't have X powered by from Express. Look at all that testing and what good testing looked like. It's a lot of work. So when you find that program's running for 18 months with no testing, 
you can imagine how much tail is on that. Um, just because it's the right thing on paper doesn't mean it's the right thing. This is definitely an architect thing, I find it quite frustrating. You talk about uh, service bus and they'll come back to you and say, well, it's Azure service bus, so it's got to be logic apps and that makes absolute sense. And you say, well, guys, did you try it? Did you try fucking using it? Because it's stupid. It doesn't work as a developer. I can't make this work. Um, and I went through this exercise recently and uh, I found three, four hundred logic apps connected to service bus um, and tried to unpick all those and they had no logging and they had no observability and they had no erroring um, and it was incredibly difficult and I ended up having to take that business on a journey through what microservices might look like and how you would assimilate all of those logic apps into a microservice that was testable, that was deployable, that was observable and what testing in production might mean for them if we collapsed eight environments down to one environment. And that was very successful, and it's probably the end of this talk to be talked about, but um, that was one of those things. Um, not everything is a little box that fits together. Yeah, we probably said that. Sometimes they look weird uh, and don't fit together. I do wish architects would just try um, and touch the metal. With my favorite phrase, touch the metal. Go and fucking do it for once, please, uh, because we have to all the time. Um, and it's so frustrating when somebody gives you something that just fundamentally doesn't work. Um, often provide the capability without the requirement. Um, I like to talk about future scanning or horizon scanning. Um, we have to do this quite often in little CTA roles. Um, architects will sometimes come and try and pitch something. We did service mesh. It's a really great thing. Right, what do you need it for? Well, it's going to give us quads over these services. Yeah, but it's only just us, us consuming it. So like, you need quads. Um, we've got we have microservices everywhere. We've got a monolith, guys. Like, we're going to use microservices. This capability, this, this constant push for we need the capability without the actual business requirement, and it probably tells back something that I say to my developers quite often, and something that I stick to very rigidly, which is develop for today's problem. Your enemy, as an engineer, is when you make something extensible or modular. Because the chances are you won't use that. And if you go and introduce something like a service bus, maybe you could have wrote that as an API. But yeah, your service bus has got 400 something apps on there costing £30,000 a month. And if you know for the next six months you're not going to use it, you now got yourself a 200 and something K bill for no reason except modularity and extensibility. And the line of code in Node.js to go and switch between them and logic app, sorry, a end rest endpoint and a service bus call from a queue or a topic is one line. Stupid, right? engineering for tomorrow's problem that doesn't even exist and you have no idea when you're going to consume the capability. So there is a trade-off with this and there is always going to be a point where you should evaluate it. You know, is this thing tomorrow, next week, then maybe we should go and do it today. Um, obviously be reasonable. But if it's something that you think might happen, and it might happen in another program later, well maybe that's actually part of the work for the program later to go and do. Um, Talking about testing and security like they aren't development, I find this very frustrating. Um, and it comes back to that point about framing something. When we talk about testing, when it's not part of development, when we talk about security, when it's not part of development, we're almost creating evidence that it isn't. <laughs> we're creating a, a, an environment where it's a separate silo, just using our words, and it adds evidence, it adds weight to the argument that it's not. And actually, I find there's a, probably a good argument to say that if we stop talking about developers and start talking about engineers, it's a nice, broad, all-encapsulating term. And I almost think that DevOps, DevSecOps, will turn into something like NG engineer, and then next generation engineer, or something. There'll be a new thing. But we need to come back to, actually, what we're doing is redefining what engineers do. We're creating a, a brand new set of, of engineers that have this incredible breadth and a new sort of skill set and that's because the ops world has shifted from this traditional appliance-based world in a data center to an abstraction that sits as code in the SDK and that's how you access your resources. So it's quite an interesting shift. Ivory tower syndrome. I get very frustrated with leadership that sits and has an ivory tower syndrome that doesn't understand the people on the program, doesn't visit the people on the program, doesn't talk to the people on the program. They have their core <laughs> leadership group around them of five people and they don't really get involved and you can talk to an engineer and they won't know who the leadership is on the program. They won't know who's leading the program, who's responsible for it, who the stakeholders are. Isn't that insane when you're trying to get people to buy in and you're trying to get their heart and say, this is something that I need you to commit to as an engineer or you just love what you're doing and these people are so far detached from the program. How can you buy into that? That's crazy. 
pretending to listen. Again, this point comes back to probably the toxicity of the programme and when people are disenfranchised or something, it's because they care. It's probably because they've told somebody that something isn't right and they care and nobody listened or nobody did anything or they didn't feel like somebody did something. So a really good point about communication and how important it is. Almost everything is a communication problem. The technical problems are very easy to solve. The communication problems with businesses are just incredibly difficult. And if you're working on something where you are um, potentially a pathfinding program um, and you're working outside probably the comfort comfortable zone of, of where that business operates and you, you're somewhere over there, you're going to end up having to retrofit all those controls and procurement procedures and everything back into your program, which is very, very difficult as well. Um, so you're probably pissing lots of people off doing that. Um, a lack of transparency with the x-ray cat. Um, this is probably a double-edged sword. When I put this one in, I was thinking about it. And I, as an engineer, I like people to be transparent with me in terms of the good and the bad and the ugly I like to know. But then as a leader, quite often, if somebody is a bit of an asshole, I probably won't go back to the program and say, well, this person's a bit of an asshole. Um, I tend to frame it a bit better than that. And I think it's something that maybe is a contentious point. A lack of talent. As we all know, DevOps is an incredibly blossoming space. Um, and we are all making a fortune right now. And we will take our gold bags and go to an island soon. Um, it's very hard to find the right talent, especially if you work for me. If you are my brand of DevOps engineer, I want you to be able to code. I want you to be able to do the whole thing. I want you to be able to take something from development all the way to production and, and show a fantastic story. And that's quite challenging to find somebody who's able to do all of those things. I don't need to be great at all of it, but I do need to tell you, get you to tell a, a valuable system story to the business. Um, and, and this is certainly challenging. And I think we go through peaks and troughs. And you know, right now DevOps is a thing, and I'm sure a couple of years time something else will be really big, and, and that's what it is. But the talent definitely short at the moment, and it's because of this phenomenal switch from appliance-based data center crap to abstractions of code in an SDK where you're having to code against infrastructure. It's a massive shift. So how how do you address that? Uh, it, that is a really good question. Um, I've just taken a team who are traditionally very ops-based. Um, I was lucky enough to have somebody on that team who had a development background. Um, I deliberately focused on that person in terms of bringing up microservices to replace launch caps, um, did the pipeline work, <coughs> paired him up with somebody who I'd spent a lot of time doing pipeline work with on its own, um, and they sort of complemented each other and started to work through it. And while uh, Marcus wasn't a dead person, uh, Dave was a great dead person. They sort of started to pick up bits from each other, which is really good. Um, on the other hand, um, when I stood a chap called Stuart up, uh, he did Terraform and infrastructure, and that was pretty much what I gave him, and I made sure the other two were pretty much had deficit in that area. Um, Stuart really didn't want to work with other team members, uh, and it was really, really frustrating, and it was actually a, a pretty critical failure to my master plan of making everyone dependent on each other. Um, I chose the wrong characters, um, so there was a, a good learning later on in that as well. Um, but I think having just the right people to be able to, to tell a story in a small pod or a squad um, it is incredibly powerful for upskilling. Um, and, and you get to inceptionalize that culture at, at ground zero. I right? take them away and say, all these things are OK. right? You don't want to know this stuff on day one. We're going to go through a massive amount of pain. I spent three days setting their machines up with them in Windows subsystem for Linux. And they didn't really understand the value of that until they hit the pipeline. And they were like, oh, OK. So I sort of basically do the shit I just did in my machine, but in the pipeline. And it made sense as a story. So controlling the narrative on that was really important as well, making sure that there was an overarching story to the thing that we were doing that was lots of repetition in that. So, so basically, you're saying uh, as long as your team has different skill sets, you can sort of cross-train and Absolutely. pair up. Absolutely. And then over time, everybody becomes competent. Yes, um, unless they want to be a solo player, in which case. Yeah, that's, 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 that will fall on the planet's face. Very, very. Um, that, that one? Yeah. Uh, business resistance to opting, uh, adopting Agile. Um, always very painful when you've got a PMO who wants to do PIP and PAB and project conceptualization and they want costs up front. And well, you're saying, well, Agile doesn't really work like that. We don't do that stuff. And historically, has that shit ever been accurate anyway? No. But we do it anyway. We go through the, the, the silly serenade. And actually, I think there's some evolution to be done there. Change control um, with DevOps will really so much faster. And there's obviously change control piece, there's business change piece that goes with it, and how that stuff fits in. Um, and 
there's obviously a lot of work to be done there and, and probably don't spend enough time with people doing this change, change control, onboarding them into a way of working and making them feel comfortable. Um, and that causes lots of friction. Uh, and then procurement as well. When I need engineers and I need them faster, I need to get through the door. It's very, very painful when you're working at Waterfall. And we've all been through this and it's, it's quite difficult. And so um, how do we go and fix these things? The old guard. Um, so the guys running programs now, these old timers, um, <laughs> I don't know what to call them. Um, they came from a, a time, um, for the dinosaurs. Maybe they don't know what good software development is. Maybe back in the day, they didn't test the level that we do. I mean, well, the test in production hashtag wasn't around at that point. Right? These guys don't understand how to do this at such a high level. Um, I don't think they really understand real transparency. So when we talk to our teams about being, it's okay to not know something, I'm the first person always the first person to put my hand up and say, we're going to do this, but I don't know how to do it. Or I will do this, and I don't know how to do it. Because I need you, as an engineer, to know that it's OK for me to do it, so it's OK for you to do it. And I say it about everything. And I need to conceptualize that culture. I need to be responsible for it. Um, I don't think people are very good at that um, from the old school. Um, I don't think when you don't do all these things, I think it's very hard to rally to support your troops, get them involved in what you're doing. It's very hard to get that love back and get them to buy in. Um, so it's important that I'm a technical leader, that I'm still remotely hands-on, um, that I can actually go and do this, I can tell those stories with them. I always make sure that I spend time doing this stuff so I can still do it, uh, and they still respect me to an extent for uh, being able to do it. Um, how do we, or validating success with the customer? Depending on your program, uh, I think most of that I'm involved in, there's always a, a, a value stream, a customer motivation, some sort of end goal. Um, being able to validate what we're doing is the right thing, being able to make sure that we can realize value of the customer, being sure that we are motivated by the customer, which is the thing that's going to drive revenue up. It's quite interesting, the shift trying to get an engineer to think about the business metrics that move the needle. So product is very, very good at this. Good product owners will say, these are the things that move the needle for the business, and these are the things that are going to impact the way that I run the team. Um, it's very difficult, and I still find myself, because I'm an engineer first, looking at system metrics and things like that, and I gravitate towards them naturally and the things that feel comfortable to me, um, rather than transactions, conversions, throughput on the platform. It's difficult for me to align to those, and I have to catch myself. And it's even more difficult telling an engineer, you need to care about these things over the system metrics. <laughs> That's a, a bit of a challenge. Um, testing in production, if you don't test, you're going to have a shit show. Um, I'd argue that I have a massive article in my blog about mono environments. Um, I would argue that if you do have lots of environments, it's a product of shitty testing. Um, and if you invested all the time you wasted conceptualizing those environments, managing those environments, the time wasted on the deltas between the environments, the double hops that that causes you, and the problems moving from environments, if you took all of that time and just had high quality testing and high quality focus on your code quality, and how you run that through to production, and feature flagging in your code, and being able to switch those feature flags in code. If you did all of those things, you'd still probably save a shit at a time, <laughs> and wouldn't have all those environments. But it's a difficult point to get to, and if you don't believe that you can save yourself in code with this stuff. Uh, you know, when I left uh, my last program, I was very confident anybody who couldn't even code would be able to change my microservice, because I would be protected, because the tests are there to protect you and then they will be able to roll this thing through, through to a production environment. Um, I even gave product owners the ability to go and do that release through uh, uh, the STS release management, which was really powerful for the business to think that actually, I was telling a story in less than five minutes that our partner wasn't able to tell for three months. But it took three months to do a release, and we could do it in five minutes through eight environments. That is a phenomenally powerful story. Would you, would you still have multiple environments? Though? No, no, just I, I test in production. It's a, I, I deeply believe in it. I just think if you hold yourself to that standard, um, it, it's almost like if you're working with microservices, right? So you're working with microservices and you need hermetic tests, so they're airtight, they don't talk to each other. With Node, you do the manipulation of the upstreams or any dependencies so that you change the pattern of the code as opposed to actually talking to the services. So you know, if you're talking to an upstream service, you're going to mock out all the replies all the failures, all the errors, and handle them without actually talking to the service, maybe wants to get the replies back. Um, 
If I then gave you Docker Compose and said, hey, actually, you can go and join all these services up together and test, you kind of have a safety net, right? Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a safety net. It's a mental safety net where I can go and do it. If I give you the environment, it's another reason for you to slack off and have that safety net. Whereas if I hold the bar high and say, you are now responsible as an engineer for pushing into production. If you push this into master, it will deploy to our customers. Have you held yourself to a high enough level? Do you think this needs a peer review? We're, we're sort of leveraging that, that fear of production to create a higher <laughs> standard of development and testing. That originates a blame culture and also handily good ideas to come up. I, I would. If you don't give them the nice opportunity of testing at scale in a different environment, Absolutely. something will never be produced. It's, defi it's definitely not a blame culture. It, it's very much, you know where the level is. We're giving you absolute freedom to, to make <laughs> sure that you're at the level. And again, if something goes wrong with post mortem and it's not about blame, it's just about making sure for us as a team, it's an exercise in, it, it, could we do something better? Did we miss something, right? If we sent something out and there's a micro, so maybe it was two microservices and they had a contract dependency and we sent one out before the other, maybe it's packed profile we need to reduce to go and make sure that there's always a chance for us to go and improve things and make things better, but we, we need to go through that and it's not, it really isn't a witch hunt, it's not, I think of a fuck. I might be hurting inside as a leader, but I would never ever tell my team that. It's really about just making sure that we catch these things and make it better and again. We can go and frame those things from the host board and take it back to the business and say, these are good things. So, so if you're just testing and deploy it into production, are you, are you using a blue-green deployment approach? Yeah, so, it's okay. Yeah. Like you can go and use um, the, the, the Netflix Canary tool to go and do these release judgments. So back to Elk, go and look at your error rate from your microservice, and then go to the delta with 1% of traffic. And if it's happy and within your tolerance levels, you can go and say, take the container with 10%. Um, off the back of this deal or something and slide that to 10, 15, 100 and use those release judgments. You still don't have to touch it and if you've got a high level of observability and you can go and look at your logs and say, yes, we're, we're happy with this. Again, it's like that complete story. It's when you can tell it, when you can show it to somebody, you can show the value of working to that level because you're never at any point saying, well, I need to manually go and do this. You're just saying, actually, I have absolute confidence that if we did 60 releases a day and we held our team to this standard, that we probably wouldn't see any problems doing that. Um, I obviously came from Pizza Hut Digital Ventures, um, DBOT that McKinsey stood up. Um, and I, I think the only thing that really failed in that environment for us was well, the way we did Canary. We did Canary under a feature flag. Um, the only thing that would ever break that is framework changes, because obviously everybody's going to get a framework change at that point. So that was the one thing that we would improve and we would have not a separate environment, but we would just go and roll those containers first and do the delta and make sure, because there are plenty of times when we came in and we would say, product, look at something, and it would be a case of, okay, we're down. Transactions are down for a Tuesday, why are we down? It looks like we're down on Android, okay. Is it all Android devices? No, Samsung devices, what's going on? It's a Samsung browser, and it's because we released React forms, and it's damaging, and it's killing something on Samsung browser, and now it's broken, right? And that's always the process, but could we have called that earlier? Yeah, we go and release this release judgment stuff, and actually that wouldn't happen. Um, so definitely not that blame just about having a hypothesis, running with it in a controlled way, where you're not gonna, you're happy with the risk profile that you apply to it. It's one, 100 users, 10 users, up to you. And then you use that to control your route into production. Again, one environment. Um, program controls only work, if you're honest. Um, most programs have controls for fuck widgery. <sighs> this is very true, right? A program is stood up with a, a control in place for things going wrong, for things not working out, for things not following the plan. How many programs have you been on when someone's manipulated the rag for, or the rag status for somebody, where they've shown something from red to amber because it looks better to the board? So many, right? And it's absolute bullshit. And the, the reason those things exist is for somebody else to get involved and say, do you need more help? Do you need more weight? Do you need more support? It's not blame. It's program controls are there to make sure that we stay on track and people are just generally not honest with them. Da, 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 da. No. Um, so, honorable mentions, uh, assholes on the program, asshole people, I used to be an asshole person, Kemp, used to be an asshole person, I used to be an asshole person, um, I still feel <laughs> an asshole person to an extent, um, they're not useful, not conductive, um, giving them estrogen really helps, um, but it's probably not an op option for the most people. Um, be really careful, these are a lot like... Um, uh, another point in a minute. Um, partners and system integrators who want to change cash. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about the ability to go and move 
all of this work that we've done in AWS, in Terraform, using the Terraform provider for AWS, into Azure, and how easy that would be, and so it was a people fucking write off, isn't it? You can't go and take one provider and move it to another to sort of work. And so that is going to be like three months. So it's total reworking numpty, right? And we've got the bug in Terraform on AKS, which is the network's not going to work. And we've got um, conditional uh, annotations and cakes that don't exist on AWS that exist in the Azure to go be an internal load balancer. <laughs> How are you going to solve all these problems, right? You're going to need Hashi, HCL, 0.11, Terraform. Lots of problems, right? And they're chasing cash. And you look at this stuff and they're like, yes, we can do multi-cloud. Well, realistically, you could probably federate over two, but then you get a really slim picking of services you can go and use. So ultimately, the only thing is like, do you want to use Azure? Do you want to go and use AWS? Which services do you want to use? Which thing works for you better as, a, as an organization? And then in our organization, how many people want to use this platform? How many people want to use that platform? And which one should we invest in? And then how's that line up with the enterprise agreement we have to go and put in place? For both of them, there's a big picture to this. Um, I never trust system integrator, integrators because they're quite often chasing an agenda. I find it very frustrating working with them sometimes. Uh, even when it comes down to tooling, they usually have allegiances to particular tooling companies, uh, and still they try and put those guys in. And actually, go and try it. Try the tooling, right? Feel the thing that works better for you. Um, no definition uh, of quality. Uh, having been through this exercise recently, trying to understand from the architects that decided to, to put this program together, what they thought quality would look like for every pillar and every component on this thing. Um, how were they ever gonna make sure this thing worked? Like, if you can't define what quality means, how you test this stuff, how you make sure it works. If you can't say what those critters of quality are, how can you expect this thing to be successful? How could a developer realize this thing? If you have to deploy seven components in Symfony, as opposed to airtight into an environment one by one, is that going to work? That works in development, but it doesn't work in production, right? Because now you can't go and take the platform down. So you can get to a certain point. It's like testing without code coverage. You can go really fast to the middle point, but the point where you have to go and change that functionality is when you start breaking things, which is why you accelerate to the middle and you start changing things because you get feedback, and then everything's fucked because you've got no test coverage and you're breaking more stuff than you're fixing. Vanity leadership. Met plenty of these people. Like being leaders, pretty shit at it. Um, Solo, the last of his kind, this guy that's always on the team that likes to work with just himself. He's probably really technically capable um, and just not a team player. This guy will let you down. <laughs> um, it, it's tempting to rely on him, tempting to rely on them, her, whatever you, they are. Um, but they will let you down ultimately and accelerate to a certain point and then you'll have all this knowledge in a fucking silo that you can't go and pass on to your guys and they will precursor work that you give them that's meant to be shared with people and Again, you end up with this bubble where you're relying on one person. It's, it's awful. Find people that are comfortable working together and sharing and co-creating. Uh, Multi-cloud story again. Um, how would this have worked? We could have federated cakes. We would have a bunch of stuff that we could share, but on the services, which is sort of fine, but what happens if you're relying on something that's over us? It's not on Azure, and if it's a strategy for what would we do if we exit one platform or another? How would that work? Well, that would probably not work too well. Um, if we're relying on DNS, we're still going to be relying on one or the other. Um, abstract cloud services, so we could go and wrap all the services. We could go and take Cognito, we could take AAD, and we could go and wrap those into some abstracted library. But now, if we had a couple of different people on a platform, and they're using different program languages, and now we've got three libraries to maintain, and all the testing, and all the things, and we need to look, which is ridiculous, right? So it's a no no option. Um, or we just offer both. And we say our platform is on both and you can consume services from both, and we can do that however we want to do it. But it's going to be quite useful if we can get a number because we can go and create an enterprise agreement with AWS, and one for Azure and get some nice pricing and go and figure out how many people might be on the platform. Co-creation is paramount. Uh, things that you can co-create, culture, um, process, uh, culture specifically, like very responsible for this. But just, just blowing up the way you act in the office. Again, I can be a bit of an asshole at times, um, I'm constantly thinking, was I too much of an asshole? Are these people going to think that I'm setting an example that being an asshole is okay? Um, and you have to evaluate that, that, that behavior quite often, and I do uh, now. <laughs> uh, process, you can co-create. Um, code, obviously, and products. Ultimately, almost everything can co-create, but if you have a culture of co-creation where you say it's okay to go and do this, if somebody says, I think we should do this a different way, um, sometimes things don't work out the way that I want. If I have a technical direction that I want to go and I think it's the right thing to go and do, 
sometimes I'd open up to the floor and actually remember my pitch wasn't that good, and the guys were going a different direction, you have to accept it. Right? It's not all in. As leadership, sometimes it's just not the right thing to do, and you have to let the team go down the rabbit hole, go on that journey and fail, and come back and do the thing. Or maybe you were wrong, right? But it's, it's, a, it's an all-in thing. You're either all-in on co-creation or you're not, and people will get disenfranchised. We're going to do Agile. And it is a bit of an experiment. Right? That's why SAFE exists. It's why all these frameworks exist. This is why we have Lean, and, and some people are really successful just doing Kanban. Some people do Scrum. How many people are doing Scrum and it doesn't work? Plenty of people. You should probably ditch it and go back and just do Kanban and figure out what cycle time looks like for you. Um, it's not a religion. This stuff can work for you, and sometimes it won't work. Pick and choose the stuff that works. If you find that you have developers standing around, doing stand-up in the morning, and the right, we've seen that, right, plenty of them, stop, do something else. Nominate someone to talk about a feature for a week. Find the areas that you're working on, say, this is a feature, this is a feature, this feature. Do that for a while. Sometimes just take a break. Sometimes it's good to do two weeks of something different, and then come back and people are really energized, come and do it again, they see the value. Just keep rotating, just keep changing. It's not something you have to stick to rigidly. I'm not a fan of safe, by the way. Um, development done. Uh, I find this very frustrating. When we talk about just doing dev and being done, it's not true, is it? Right? We've got test and we've got security and deploy, and they usually end up in that order, and it's very frustrating. And actually, all of these things are actually part of development. Right? And that fake cycle time that we define over there is quite frustrating because we say to the business, it's going to take this long. We're going to do that, but then there's this little fucking tail over here, again, all the time. And when you're in the middle of delivering something, you do this first little bit, and then you end up with test failing. So we go and pass one thing here, and the test goes and spits five things back. And where do they go? They're back into the dev queue. So they go and push something out that way, and then it stops working. So it's like a magic multiplication machine. So actually, our true cycle time is that. And whatever that means, we should just go back and say, that is our true cycle time. How many people are in that flow? How many, that, how many ever many SIs or tests or QAs, whatever, right? If you define the end-to-end -end process, you'll naturally start to co-create because these guys will have a contractual responsibility to start delivering, and then we say, well, test, they're screwing up, and actually, they'll probably start focusing, how can we help you test, how can we do things a bit better, how can we improve this? And that cycle time becomes true, right? It's a, it's a truth in how long in terms it takes you to do software development properly. Like that. It's really hard to do that in animations, by the way. Um, so far, a shit ton of things can go wrong. Uh, I haven't really told you how to fix them, and it's sort of difficult. And I've got maybe a few points that could be quite useful. It's like Star Wars, right? I realized halfway through I could make this whole thing look like Star Wars. Uh, anyway, it's, far, far away. it's fucking great. I can do this all day. Um, when I run my teams like a product team, I try and tell a story. Um, being successful with code for a developer, it's like an orgasm. It's really exciting, right? So, so having those wins and success, it's a, it's a real thing. So during the week, we try and tell a story, which is quite useful. Um, and I try and make sure that that uh, story fits into a theme that we're following for the week. Um, and I try and make sure that it's an overarching story that means that whether it's three days or two days to do a feature that by the end of the week we get to the end and it's deployed and it's in production and it's with the PO or whatever and we're happy with it and it's done. We try and constrain that to a week because it's a nice, reasonable time and then people get to the weekend and they have their weekend free and they have to worry about the thing that didn't get done. And again, we're relying on the fact that we have our cycle time very, very accurate in these teams. Absolutely key if you're trying to frame it like that as a product owner. Um, little wins, right? Five little wins, or could be two wins and three down there. Um, I like the slide. Just paid a hundred dollars for someone to do a unicorn that's actually mine instead of one I stole. Yeah. Um, there are four poos. I should have reduced it to three, maybe. Um, DevSecOps will make your shit go faster, right? It's the universal truth. We'll quickly highlight a quality problem. Will not magically fix shit. I walked into a business the other day and they said our biggest problem is DevOps. And I immediately knew their biggest problem was shit development. And it's true, right? It's just shit. Look at this downstream. If we do DevOps, if you go and do that little bit, like what the industry, what the recruiters think that DevOps is, if we go and do that, we're just going to ship shit faster to a bigger pile, right? A bigger mess. If we go and give you CI and CD, 
and let you go to production straight away, you're just going to break everything, right? Without the ability to think, ah, I'm building a feature, what do my external monitors look like? What do my synthetic tests look like? How do I make sure that this thing actually works in production? And then reframing things to say that part of development is to write these tests, to write these external monitors. It's a really important point. The best product owners that I've met know how to build tech first. They are not SMEs. They do not come from the business with the main knowledge. They understand how to build tech products and they will back learn the knowledge for that domain and retrofit that domain knowledge into themselves. The difference is phenomenal. Being able to run a dev team and wrangle the dev team out to get the product as nucleus and the devs as the electrons buzzing around and, and pandering to, to product. Being able to reverse those roles is so core. Cool. And when you get products wrong, they don't really understand how to work with developers. What's the point of doing product, right? It's super pointless. Um, good product will engage their tech lead and team. They'll rely on the tech lead. The tech lead will protect the team from having such crazy meetings and stuff like that. And so. It's quite good that, again, running as a product, if you're precursoring the day, if you can do it at the end of the day or the beginning of the day to make sure you're still telling that story, and if you need to go and pivot because metrics are off and you go and release something, you start to handle it again, that you can go and change the theme of that day. You're always controlling the story, and a good product person will be able to do that. Um, and test the moment that something is ready. Again, adhering to that fact that we're trying to very quickly tell the story and make sure the things that we're building are correct and valid and product to the people that we are to look at the stuff that we've built and say, yes, that is correct. Scrum bar, agile, fragile, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you are doing it and it's deeply fucked, go back to this point here from the build, measure, and learn. Absolutely core to what we do. Um, should look like that. Just take your Kanban board, keep it very simple, don't create 23 columns. You don't need them to start with. You'll probably go on that journey at some point, and then we'll come back to four columns again. Um, <laughs> you've been on that journey, eh? Um, <laughs> was our feature small enough, right? If you run this exercise and you fucked it up and you're doing Scrum, or you run this exercise, you're going to know if you can run this thing through in a week, right? You're going to know, did we estimate to a small, did we break something down to a small enough size that could be done in a week? In two weeks, after running this exercise twice, we'll be better than we were in week one. We'll know if we improved on our estimation if that was off. We would have got better. Um, measure would be better. So if you just reset and you think about how this stuff should work, and you run this through and you take the time to go and figure out what your true cycle time is, you can honestly start achieving better results soon. And the best thing about Agile is the moment you start doing it properly, the moment it starts manifesting good quality and good outcomes. After two weeks, you'll have that established cycle time. Uh, and as a product team, knowing your cycle time, you'll know how long something takes. When we go to business, and actually, we're getting better at this. Look, you can see our velocity going up. You can see a consistent number of products and features being produced every single time that we go and do this. Um, which is why we break things down um, and create smaller fault domains in a, in a program. Coming back to how to fix programs, I don't have a really great answer, actually. Um, there are lots of things that can go wrong, and they're very, very frustrating. But being able to, in a team, tell that story, take the um, thinnest slice of something um, and define what success meant for that is such a powerful story. And I've told this to stakeholders, I've told this to C-level execs, I've gone and told, taken this thing and said, hey, this is how we do development. Come and, and work with us. Let, let me show you how this works. Um, find a sponsor. If you want to be successful, find somebody who's going to empower you uh, to do this or bail you out if you go and do this without permission and then piss everybody off, which is what I do. Um, so go and find somebody who's got your back, quite important. Um, find the thinnest slice uh, of success because you're in control of the frame. So go try and solve the whole program's problems. Go and take a really small slice of functionality and run it through all the way to production and tell that good development story. Um, lead by example, again. Your Kanban board is something that people can walk with you. You can take a C-level exec, you can take a sponsor, you can take someone from the program and say, look, this is our story. This is a week's story, but it's the whole story for this week. You can see what's going on every fucking day. If you're a stakeholder in what we're doing, come and walk the board with us. And if you haven't read Flow, 
read the book Flow, because there's some really great points in there about how this stuff works and, and what boards look like and how to walk them and how to get executive buy-in by walking the boards and what they, boards they should have. Um, even the concept of having a job board, if you're a really big department and you have people working in certain places, why not have a job board where people can change, right? Some people want to do maintenance, some people want to do new stuff, new stuff is really taxing, some people roll and burn out of that and they want to go and do maintenance for a bit and then they want to swap and why not have fungible engineers that we can interchange? Uh, parts of mind technique, I love these programs, bit of a, a military one for me, but um, we need to go and win the hearts and minds of the program. Uh, invite people to see what you have built. If in a ship program, almost certainly people are quite cagey and they don't want to let you in and see the stuff that you've done. Invert it, right? Bring them in, hey, come and look at the stuff that we've built, let me show you, right? Get those engineers riled up and get them to show people what they've built. They'll be really enthusiastic, they'll love their FaceTime with people, and it's a huge win for people in the program to go and see what you've built. Um, people can buy a story that they can watch. So again, if this is visual, if you can go and say, I'm doing a microservice change, I'm adding a new level of logging, I'm pushing this through into CI, it goes into CD, I'm pushing this into a brand new environment, it's on case, here's the container, here's the container role, I'm going to go and access the service and send the bogus payload through, here's this line of logging, it's indexed in Elastic, here's my chatbot, it's pulling Elastic, and now it's pushing that alert back into Slack. To tell that story, is so powerful and will change most people's minds on what good development looks like. Being able to visually tell that story step by step, almost anyone can understand it. But it's a phenomenally powerful story that will get you probably what the outcome that you want. Um, again, Terraform, Inferous Code. Take that thin slice, go and build the infrastructure, show them how you maintain a consistent environment in the cloud. Go build that microservice with that high level of testing and show them how much work it was to go and do that and what the deficit is. Go and do the CI and roll that container into Kate. Go and roll that container into Kate and have that new line of logging go to Logbeats and then shift to Elastic and then go and have your lap chat. I'll pick it up. It seems like stupid and almost intuitive or whatever, but I've had consistent success over and over again with programs that have failed by saying this is how we do good development, this is how we show observability, this is how we show monitoring, this is CI and CD. Just being able to take almost every part of that shows you an aspect of good development, right? Twelve factor. Security is buildable. Start doing that today. I think I'll start that from another slide. It's like mascara, because mascara is buildable, right? Only a girl's going to get that. Um, here's my shirt. Um, tell me if it was good or crap. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have questions? Did I, what did I hear? What time was that? Uh, 1.30. You're good. You're good. <laughs> You've got 10 minutes if, if need to be. Any more questions for... Aubrey? I've got a quick oh, question sorry. about testing, what, what your views are on uh, testing declarative code. Ah, so, so like Terra, te using Terra, Terra, Terra Kitchen? Chart, oh, well, and uh, Helm charts, yep. um, you know, Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, I've been sort of mulling this over on myself, to be honest. Um, it's difficult because you're not testing the outcome, right? Um, well, I, I see some people making unit tests. Yeah. Using uh, in spec or whatever to test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Terraform security group has been creating. Yeah. It doesn't make sense with such a declarative code. Yeah, I also feel the same way, if I'm honest, and it's frustrating because I don't think it, I'm not sure if it's the right way to feel, but I don't feel like I should go and test that and make sure I did the thing. Yeah. I feel like if I'm doing Terraform Kitchen and I'm looking at, you know, did I go and create something with the right name? Did I create the right number of those resources? Potentially useful. I don't know. The way that we work with these things tends to be like, do it, validate it, but it does work. Can't really drift from that. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit different. So uh, where would you persuade a program that uh, those tests aren't valuable and what other tests would you put in that are valuable? Um, gosh, that's a tough question. I guess it depends on your track history, right? So if you've got a track history of screwing it up, then those tests will immediately look like they're valuable. If you've got a track history of dropping them and actually having the same success and not failing, then you could argue that a visual check or a manual check or a manual effort is enough. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. It, for me, um, it comes down to the team, right? And if, it's, if, if your squad is happy doing that and you're happy not having those tests and they make sense and we feel like, you know, I guess other teams don't have a problem with that, then I think that's fine if we make a decision as a program that that's not what we're going to do. Um, certainly if you do have quality issues, then it's very hard to argue the case that you shouldn't have that stuff. 
I think if you've got existing quality issues, you have mistakes that have been introduced for a while, that's where you know, the, the case is virtually already made that you should have them. I guess in some cases, and from your experience, what happens is you're dealing with project managers or program managers that just want to set the bar high more than anything else yeah. just because tradition, because he powers them, and then makes it difficult to set the, where those tests go right. The, yeah. bar, the bar should be high, don't get me wrong, and I think... I don't know, maybe it could be high because it's nice to be high, rather than be high because I'd say it's be high. Yeah, I think, you know, having gone through the Tower Kitchen stuff, like, it could be grindy as fuck writing those tests. Like, it's not like writing code. If I write code, I can spin that shit out, and I know my frameworks very well. If I write the Tower Kitchen stuff, it's really fucking grindy. And I quite often look at it and go, I don't know if I see the value in this. Yeah. <laughs> and if I'm saying that to myself, there probably isn't value and I should just get rid of it. Yeah. So I tend to follow that. I think it'd be different if it's procedural code and maybe with the next version of Terraform, maybe yeah. you go, okay, something needs to be tested. HL 2.0, I mean, if you've got conditionals and stuff like that, and then that leads me to believe that maybe we should be doing that stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's not conditional, it's decorative, and there's no yeah. other outcome. Yeah. Then. And the same for Helm charts? Or yeah, yeah, I'd say probably the same. Yeah. Uh, there was one question. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that it's, it, it makes you to say it's a trial and you know, you are the ones of all the rights. But how would you set, and especially if you're looking to convey something to the board, how would you set and qualify and prioritize a program objectives? <coughs> yeah. You effectively have to basically make it start and say, look, this is important, yeah. this is what we need to be looking at first, and this is why. Well, the pro uh, you would hope that your executive sponsors tell you the thing that's important to them, right? right? So it's not for the program to decide. Pro the board will go and tell you these are these programs are set up to achieve business objectives. Right. right. Here's all the thing, and that's Flo talked about having an executive board that says here are the objectives of the business, here are the programs that support those objectives, so they can actually visually see the things that make sense, the things that maybe like an exec on the way out dropped and said here's this little program, vanity program, and it's mincing by, and we should go and kill it. They should guide you in terms of what's valuable, the thing that, that is going to move the needle. If you've got the right product owners and you've the right leadership in there, they should also know. I mean, have been told what is valuable to the business, and that should be the direction that they go. Obviously, if you've got technical constraints in terms of bringing up a new project or sorry, a new platform, um, you're going to have to go and organise that in a way that makes sense that you can get to that value quicker. Um, and there, there might be technical constraints, but it's always going to be a drive in terms of what the business feels like is the most valuable thing. Taking out the technical constraints on the way. True. Is it, in your experience, has it ever happened that there's, there's, there's been a conflict in terms of what you actually perceive as a technical as a technical objective versus a business objective? Absolutely. Time. Absolutely. Almost all the time. Yeah. I think um, <coughs> but that comes down to a little bit of safe <coughs> and making sure that those execs are close to the program. Where we've seen the most success, we've had executives that are, are very, very close to the program. We have sea level people coming down and talking. I can't tell you what powerful experience it is for your engineers to have somebody from the sea level come down and say, I've heard really great things about what you're doing. I'd love for you to walk me through it. That message is just, <coughs> for everybody, very, very powerful that we have care, <coughs> we're interested. And again, that you know, engineers are saying, well, you guys come down to figure out what I'm doing. And he's heard really great things about it. So it's a massive message. But everybody's on point. And when you don't have it, it's a little bit, you know, who are you working for, right? Any more? Oh, that's good. Uh, one more. Can you explain the mascara thing? I missed it. The, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I've poked myself in the eyes with this enough time and I squirted like fake eyelash glue into my eye, but mascara is buildable. So you, you can do layers on top of it. It's buildable, right? You layers and then by the time you've got to the fifth layer, you look like an old lady who can't do mascara properly. So just keep going over and over it. Yeah. Uh, 